Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to yet another Thursday lunchtime lecture. It really is wonderful to be talking to you all this afternoon. Um, and a warm welcome, especially um, to our members who are joining us for the very first time. Um, if this is your first time watching one of our lectures, please do comment in that Facebook box. Tell us um, if it is your first time watching and let us know where you're watching from. Um, I see we've got people from St. Lucia, Canada, Malaysia, um, United States, um, Scotland and right across the UK. So wherever you are watching, um, a warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. Now, for those of you who are watching um, for the very, very first time, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly um, share with you um, how you can access our lectures and how these lectures work really. Um, so, um, our lectures are always free of charge. Um, we never charge um, for you to access them. So please don't click on any external links and please never give people your card details if they ask for them. Um, they are always free of charge. Um, the best way for you to access our lectures though is to make sure that you hit that like button on our main Facebook account and make sure you follow us. Um, there is a video link in the description of this film um, which tells you how you can sign up and follow us. And what that will do, it will trigger a notification whenever we go live with these lectures. You will get a notification on your Facebook screen saying that we've gone live and you just click that and it takes you straight to our live stream. Now, if you have any problems, though, just hit that direct message button on our page and send us a message. And either myself or my colleagues will be on hand to help you. Now, if you enjoy these lectures, please, again, hit that like button, share these lectures with your friends and family. Also, do go onto our events page. Um, we've got lots more lectures coming up, so we've got details of our upcoming lectures there. Um, and again, please share those with your friends and family. But please do consider making a donation to help us in caring for our 356 historic churches in England. As a result of COVID-19, we're facing a half a million pound shortfall um, in our funding. Um, that's because we've not been able to do events like we normally would and other activities such as fundraising in our church. We've not been able to do that because of COVID. So not only have we got to raise that amount, um, we've had some great news lately where we've been awarded um, over a million pounds from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. However, as a result of that funding, we've got to raise an additional £350,000 um, in match funding to enable us to do works at a number of our churches. Now, one of the churches that we're going to be um, hoping to do some work at is at St. Mary the Virgin in Bungay, which I'm really excited is going to be talked about today. So um, I hope you enjoy hearing a bit more about that church. Now, in response to these lectures, we've actually launched a special membership offer. Now, if you join us as a member um, from as little as £3.50 a month by direct debit, we'll be sending you a free copy of Matthew Burns' Beautiful Churches book. Now, this is a wonderful book that has some amazing photography in it and tells you some amazing facts about some of the churches that we've saved in our 50 years of being in existence. But there are lots of other reasons um, for why you should become a member. Um, one of them is that you get an amazing magazine um, a couple of times a year, which is called Pinnacle. Um, now, this is a brilliant members mag newsletter. It talks about some of the work that we're doing at our church. It takes you behind the scenes with our conservation team and other colleagues. So it really gives you um, a behind the scenes um, access to our churches. Now, if you've got any questions about becoming a member or if you've got any questions about donating, please do um, send us a message or comment and we'll send you a reply. Now, today we are joined by Dr. Francis Young, um, and it's really great that he's joining us today. He is a folklore um, specialist and he is um, going to be talking to you today about folklore or macabre folklore in our churches. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture, but if you've got any questions or any problems, please do um comment away, or as I said, send us a message and we'll be on hand to help. But over to you, Francis. Well, thank you very much, George. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what I've got on my PowerPoint. So if you bear with me just a moment. Okay, that should now be visible. Excellent. Well, good afternoon. As we draw closer to Halloween, 
My talk today looks at some of the more macabre and sinister aspects of the folklore surrounding England's parish churches. Now, parish churches are usually the oldest building in a village. They're often a center of community life, and they're invested with an immense weight of cultural memory and collective meaning. Most of it positive, but some of it occasionally on the darker side. In this talk, I'm going to have a particular focus on folklore from the east of England and East Anglia. And that's really because it's where I'm from. It's also the area that I have tended to write about in my writings on folklore. But bear in mind that traditions very similar to the ones that I'm going to describe exist throughout England. And please feel free to go away and explore and look at what your local area and your local churches might have to offer in this regard, because there are many, many more stories than the ones that I'm going to share with you today. But as George just mentioned, I'm going to start by talking about a church that's in the care of the Church's Conservation Trust, and that's St Mary's Church in Bangi. That's in Suffolk, where I'm from, and it's a small market town in the northeast of the county, close to the border with Norfolk. Now, incidentally, it's in the care of the CCT, and as well as being a parish church, St Mary's Bungie was, before the Reformation, a nunnery, a Benedictine nunnery. In this photo, you can just see the ruined buildings that are behind the standing church. And those are the chancel of the church that was used as a choir by the nuns. But in the churchyard, we'll find this rather strange object. It's a stone that's clearly not a gravestone. Uh, it's clearly not a tomb of any kind. It doesn't have an inscription on it, and it's just by the west door of the church, and it's known as the Devil's Stone. Local folklore says that if you run round this stone seven times, then the devil will appear. There are various other variants to this story, like run round it 12 times and listen, and it will tell you who you're going to marry. But what's interesting about this stone is that it is, in fact, a glacial erratic. That's to say it's a stone that was washed down from a glacier at the end of the last ice age and deposited in the landscape. And it so happens that Bungie Church, many hundreds of years later, was built right next to it. And in fact, we find these throughout East Anglia, and they're often invested with a huge amount of supernatural meaning. And that's because East Anglia doesn't have any natural stone. The only occurring stone that you'll find in East Anglia is flint, which is why so many of the churches are built out of it. And so whenever these other stones are found, they are regarded as, as freakish, supernatural, and even sinister. There's another example not too far away. Uh, this is in the suburb of Alton, which is a, a, originally a village in its own right, now a suburb of Lowestoft. And this one is also a glacial erratic, but the Victorians decided to turn it into a memorial. And you can see that some words have been carved on the front in memory of a gentleman called George Edwards. But the local tradition surrounding this stone is that the fairies dance around it on moonlit nights. So again, it's another example of this tradition about glacial erratics, but these particular examples I've chosen because they are located in churchyards. But the best known story connected to St Mary's Bungie is not the Devil's Stone, but a story about a black dog, the black dog of Bungie. On the 4th of August, 1577, the people of Bungie were gathered at prayer in St Mary's Church in the middle of a very noisy thunderstorm. And right in the middle of the storm, the doors of the church burst open and ran, running up the aisle was a giant spectral black dog with blazing red eyes, larger than any dog should naturally have been, about the size of a small horse, according to the accounts. And it ran into the church and managed to kill a man and a boy before it ran out again. The steeple of the church was struck by lightning. And according to the pamphlet, the black dog then materialized a few miles away, quite a few miles away, at the Suffolk village of Blytheborough. And at Blytheborough, the black dog similarly caused carnage, 
but also left its scorching claw marks on the door of the church, where they are to be seen to this day. Now, how you interpret this story is, of course, up to you. But black dogs have a long association with churches and churchyards in the east of England. In areas of the north of England that were most affected by Scandinavian culture under the Viking Dane law, there's a tradition of a black dog known as the churchyard grim. Now, according to some stories, the churchyard grim is the ghost of a dog deliberately killed at the time of the consecration of the church in order to act as a spiritual guardian protecting the church from the devil. And I think there might be a connection here with something that we often find in old English houses, and that is dead animals that have been either buried underneath the floor or sometimes immured inside the walls, apparently deliberately. And no one's entirely sure why this is the case, but there's some meaning associated with this to do with the warding off of evil. Perhaps one of the most extreme examples in the 1890s when a Methodist chapel was being constructed in the Fens near Ely, the local workmen managed to get hold of a horse's head from the butchers and buried a horse's head underneath the Methodist chapel and poured beer over it in libations. And then the Methodist chapel was built on top of it. And that perhaps is a, 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 an echo, a, a relic of this earlier practice to do with a ritual slaughtering of animals at the foundation of a church. Another tradition has it that the churchyard grim is the ghost of a dog that was driven over the threshold of a newly consecrated church. The story being that when a church is newly consecrated, the devil will be angry and will want to claim the first living thing that crosses over the threshold. And so the dog is sent over the threshold, rather like the story of the dog being tied to the mandrake to pull up the mandrake because the scream of the mandrake will kill any living thing that pulls it up. Um, so that's another uh, theory. But the spirit of the black dog then lingers as an omen of approaching death. And in those villages that have a church grim tradition, the church grim is often seen howling outside the house of someone who is about to die. Now, it's worth noting that Grimm is actually an alternative name for the Old English and Norse god Woden or Odin, under his guise as a mysterious traveller who appears in disguise in order to test the hospitality of strangers. And the English countryside is littered with place names derived from Grimm, like Grimsdyke, many of them close to churches. Woden was a shapeshifter, a characteristic that sometimes ascribed to the churchyard grim. In one account of a churchyard grim that was recorded in 1891, and this was seen between Gillingham and Galston in Norfolk, a woman was walking with her daughter when the daughter saw what she described as a hateful thing. It was black, shifting in size, and walking with a horrible ungainly gait and something in size and shape between a horse and a large dog and it was walking ahead of them. Only the daughter could see the hateful thing until she touched her mother and then her mother was able to see it. The creature then went into Galston churchyard. Supernatural black dogs are a staple of East Anglian folklore, often called black shuck, and the churchyard variety should perhaps be seen as a subspecies of a broader folkloric trend. The spiritual potency of churchyards and the presence of the bodies of the dead made them the ideal locations for performing illicit acts of magic. The engraving that you should be able to see on your screens portrays the magician Edward Kelly, who was the assistant of John Dee, John Dee being the, the famous magician and astrologer who advised Elizabeth I. And in this particular engraving, Dee and Kelly, I presume, uh, are conjuring a spirit which has risen in its shroud from the grave in a churchyard. Witches were sometimes accused of performing strange rites in churchyards. In 1616, Susan Barker was accused of digging up a skull in Upminster churchyard in order to work spells with it. 
probably what she was looking for was a skull that would utter oracles. There was a belief that you could summon a spirit into a dead man's head and it would then utter the, the prophecies about the future for you. In another case, on the 7th of January, 1538, the parishioners of St. Michael Crooked Lane in the city of London were horrified when the wax effigy of a baby was exhumed in the churchyard. At first they thought it was a real child's body, but it turned out to be made of wax. And a local scrivener who claimed to be skilled in occult arts identified this as an attempt to bring death on a real child by sympathetic magic. The idea that you make a wax effigy of the child, bury it in the churchyard, and as that effigy decays, so the, the real child will suffer illness and death. The rumor then spread that the child in question was Prince Edward, the infant son of Henry VIII, who became King Edward VI, and this brought the case national attention. In the West Country, a belief grew up that churchyard earth had qualities a bit similar to holy water in the pre-Reformation era. The belief was that churchyard earth should be scattered on the doorstep to repel the devil and protect a house from harm. There were also stories of people sh throwing churchyard earth at spectres and apparitions to make them disappear. And this belief seems to have grown up as a sort of replacement for holy water, which of course was done away with at the time of the Reformation, as a result of the fact that churchyard earth was consecrated ground. Another echo of pre-Reformation beliefs seems to be found in the claim by a man accused of witchcraft in Ely in 1647. This is during the notorious witch hunt of Matthew Hopkins through East Anglia. And this man claimed he'd taken consecrated bread after the service in St. Mary's Church in Ely and held it in his hand while urinating against the wall of St. Mary's Church. And the man had been told that if he did this, a toad would appear, would consume the consecrated bread, and that would make the man a witch and give him power to harm his neighbors. Jumping forward a couple of centuries, in the mid 19th century, a self-professed witch living in the village of Loddon in Norfolk used to advise young women to perform a rite of divination in the churchyard which was expressed in the form of a verse as follows. To gain a husband, name known or unknown, make your choice on a graveyard stone. Quarter day's night, if they're fair a moon, pass through the church gate right alone. Twist three roses, crosses from graveyard bits, plant them straight in your finger slits. Over the grave, hold a steady hand and learn the way the side crosses stand. One is yourself and your husband one, and the middle one need be named of none. If they both on the middle cross have crossed, his name you win and a year you've lost. For he who lies in the namesake mould, his soul has sold, or he would have sold, and you give a year which the dead may use, your last year of earth life that you lose. So essentially what the charm is saying is that if you want to know the name of your future husband, the sacrifice you have to make is that you will actually lose a year of your life. Now this divination rite is rather similar to practices associated in East Anglia and the East Midlands with St. Mark's Eve, that's the 24th of April. It was actually St. Mark's Eve rather than Halloween, which in East Anglia was considered to be the spookiest night of the year, the night when the veil between this world and the next was at its thinnest. A belief found throughout the East of England was that if you stood in the church porch at midnight on the 24th of April, you would see the shades of those who were destined to come, uh, sorry, those who were destined to die in the following year. So the shades would pass out of the church into the churchyard and then lie down in their future graves. It's a curious story because these are ghosts, but they're ghosts of people who are destined to die rather than ghosts of people who are already dead. There's a vivid description of somebody who did this by John Clare, the poet who lived in the, uh, the village of Helpston just outside Peterborough. 
And one of the scary parts of this story, perhaps the, the most chilling aspect of it, is that once you've done this, according to Claire, but also according to other sources, once you've done it once, you're then doomed to do it ever after. You have to go and, and stand in the church porch every 24th of April. You don't have a choice about it. And so you're kind of burdened with this knowledge that you must know who is going to die in the year ahead. And therefore it's a, a kind of divine punishment really for your curiosity in wanting to know it, that you therefore have to know it, if you like. The stereotyped association between churchyards and ghosts goes back a very long way. It has its roots in the early medieval origin of ghosts in revenants. Now the difference between a ghost and a revenant is that a ghost, certainly in the way we think about it in popular culture, you know, Ghostbusters or Casper the Friendly Ghost, whoever you want, our ghosts tend to be these kind of gauzy, ethereal beings that float above the ground and are the disembodied souls of the deceased. Whereas a revenant is a much more earthy, earthbound creature. A revenant is the reanimated corpse of someone who has just died and will therefore often be in a putrefying state. And when you go back to the Middle Ages, it was often revenants rather than ghosts that are described in ghost stories. These reanimated corpses were thought to rise from their graves and attack the living. In 2017, archaeologists investigating the abandoned medieval village of Warham Percy in Yorkshire found that bodies buried in the churchyard had been attacked by parishioners after death. The corpses' limbs had been deliberately broken, their heads smashed in, and they'd been cut with sharp implements. And this strongly suggested to the archaeologists that the villagers feared these bodies rising again. That's borne out in another description by the chronicler William of Newburgh in the 12th century, who describes the case of a man whose putrefying body rose after his death and wandered about sucking the blood of the living until it was mutilated by vigilantes. This is essentially the English version of the Eastern European vampire. A rather more light-hearted churchyard supernatural incident was recorded by Erasmus, the great Renaissance humanist, who told the tale of a group of students who decided to terrify a superstitious priest by creating mysterious moving lights in the churchyard. They did this by fixing candles to the backs of crabs and then sending the cra setting the crabs loose in the churchyard and they moved around between the gravestones. The priest took these to be the souls of the dead coming from purgatory in order to ask him for prayers and masses. Now Erasmus's story was designed to mock people for their superstition about and particularly for being credulous about purgatory. But I think it serves as a useful reminder that medieval people weren't primarily frightened of ghosts. It wasn't a sort of existential dread that was their reaction to the apparition of the dead. Instead, they were concerned when ghosts appeared because it shamed the living. It was an indication that something wasn't right. Ghosts appeared when the living failed to discharge their duties towards the dead. And ghosts could therefore be dealt with fairly easily usually by offering masses or prayers or other forms of satisfaction which would send those ghosts back to purgatory. The Reformation changed all that because there was no longer any way to placate the restless dead. I would argue therefore that it was after the Reformation that the churchyard became truly a place of terror. Now turning from the churchyard to the interior of the church, there are many fewer stories and traditions of macabre goings on inside churches themselves, probably because the church was a consecrated space and therefore in the eyes of many, a place that was protected from the devil, ghosts and witches. Stories of witches profaning churches and even holding Sabbaths inside them, which we, we sometimes find on the continent, and even in Scotland are unknown in England. 
Although there are many stories of the devil attacking towers and steeples of churches, which one way to interpret those is as a way of explaining lightning strikes and other unexplained accidents. But one example of folklore concerning the interior of the church that's often wrongly portrayed as official church doctrine is the belief that fonts were placed close to a church's north door so that the devil could escape once cast out of the child being baptized. Now, it's certainly true that until 1552, every child who was baptized would also be exorcised with a fairly blood curdling formula that banished the devil, cast the devil out from the body of that child who was being baptized. And it's also true that the north is the direction associated with Satan in medieval magic. But the real reason why fonts are often located next to a church's north door is actually a, a bit more prosaic. And it's simply because baptism is the entrance to the Christian faith. And therefore it was established ancient symbolism right from late antiquity that the font would be placed close to the entrance to the church building or sometimes outside it in the earliest churches so that the, that symbolism was reinforced. However, people really did come to believe this story about the, the devil being cast out of children and fleeing through the north door. Uh, certainly by the 16th century, people did believe that. So church doors were often left open to let the devil out. But this is actually not something that the church ever officially taught. Church interiors were also sometimes the scenes of stories of exorcism. In English folklore, exorcisms usually involved a group of priests or a group of parsons, seven of them, nine of them, or 12 of them, all of course magic numbers, who gathered in the church to read prayers until a ghost or a boggart or other evil spirit was forced into a bottle or another container or even in the case of the legendary Sir John Sean into a boot. And uh, on the screen, you'll see a depiction from a, a rood screen in Norfolk of Sir John Sean holding his boot. And you can just see the devil poking out of the top because he's forced the devil into the boot by his prayers. The bottle or other container was then thrown into a deep body of water. Exorcism was sometimes confused with excommunication which ended with the tolling of a bell, the closing of the Bible, and the snuffing out of a candle, hence the phrase bell, book, and candle. And in fact, this wasn't too far from the truth because there are various liturgies that excommunicate the devil as a form of exorcism, which I have to admit has always puzzled me because excommunication presumes that you're a communicant member of the church, which presumably the devil isn't a communicant member of the church, but anyway. One of the oddest objects that was located in a pre-Reformation English church was found at Winfarthing in Norfolk. And this was known as the Good Sword of Winfarthing, a mysterious sword whose origins remain obscure that hung on the wall of this church. And this was a, a sword very popular among married women because if a married woman went to pray at that sword, and asked God for her husband to be taken away, then her husband was guaranteed to die within a year. So the story went. So the good sword of Winfarthing, at a time when there was, of course, no divorce, no escape from an abusive husband or an unwanted husband unless he died, the good sword of Winfarthing was a last resort for women who really wanted to be shot of their spouse. The good sword scandalized the Protestant reformers, of course, and it was removed at the Reformation. But it's an interesting example of how prayer in the pre-Reformation church could easily tip over into something a bit more like magic and rather sinister magic at that. England's pre-Reformation churches were filled with frightening images of demons in doom paintings or skeletons in memento mori, those reminders of mortality or stories like the tale of the three living and the three dead. And some would say that these served a rather cathartic purpose in a society where 
death was common, death was close to people. And therefore, if you were frightened by it every day in these gruesome pictures, perhaps it seemed less frightening in reality. I don't know. But at the Reformation, this aspect of English religious life was quite literally whitewashed as church walls were covered over with lime wash. The image that you can see on your screens is a detail from the famous Weniston doom near Dunwich in Suffolk. The Reformation did away with these images, but left behind a more insidious kind of dread. The fear that the abolition of the mass left the dead angry and vengeful. The fear that those who died without the last rites of the Catholic Church might return to haunt the living. And the sense that the abolition of things like exorcisms, blessings, holy water, left the living defenseless against the dead and against the devil. Perhaps it was this kind of fear, consciously acknowledged or unconsciously felt, that produced incidents like the, fa the famous black dog of Bungie. The Reformation had banished the superstitions of popery, but had it let the devil into the church. I'm going to finish up with some book recommendations. If you've been interested in anything that you've heard, uh, there are many, many books I could recommend, but I'm going to stick to four to begin with. One of them is called Bogey Tales of East Anglia uh, by Margaret Helen James, the cousin of M.R. James, who some of you may have heard of as a great writer of ghost stories. But Margaret James collected the folklore of East Anglia and this book was first published in 1891, but I recently brought out a modern edition of it since it's been out of print essentially since shortly after it was published. But several of the stories that I have related in this talk are actually taken from that book. There's quite a bit of church lore in there. Another book that I would highly recommend if you're interested in black shuck, black dogs, um, there is a book called Black Dog Folklore by Mark Norman that is an excellent study of that aspect of folklore. Two other books that I would recommend if you're interested in the way in which people thought about ghosts and revenants and their relationship with the dead in, med in medieval and early modern England. Um, there's a book by Peter Marshall called Beliefs and the Dead in Reformation England. And that's really about what I ended my talk on, that transition from the medieval church to the Reformation church and the way that people interacted with the dead very differently. And there's quite a lot on, in there on ghosts and revenants and spectres and so forth. And then if you're particularly interested in the medieval aspect, there's a wonderful book by Nancy Cacciola, which came out around the same time as those remarkable archaeological discoveries at Warren Percy, called Afterlives, The Return of the Dead in the Middle Ages. And that looks at um, revenants, at these kind of reanimated cadavers and all these strange medieval beliefs about ghosts and the dead and purgatory and so forth. And I would highly recommend those as four books to start with if you're interested in these matters. And with that, I'll finish and I'll hand back over to George. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Francis. That was um, phenomenal. I'm just gonna stop your screen sharing there. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, it's um, great, we've got nearly a thousand people watching live. So um, uh, there's been lots of um, comments coming through. I think you've um, put a lot of husbands, um, and made them a bit wary about the sword at wind farthing there. So, um, People, everyone, please do keep your comments coming. Do um, submit your questions now. We're about to go into question time. Um, so before we go into the, our question time, um, as I mentioned at the start of this lecture, these lectures are always free of charge. Um, we don't put um, any fee for you to join them and we make recordings of them, which are available for you to watch free of charge also. We've got 19 recordings so far. This is gonna be our 20th and you can watch them all free of charge on our Facebook um, playlist or on our YouTube channel. Um, but please do consider supporting us um, in helping us to care for historic churches and their wonderful heritage across England. We've got 356 churches that we own and look after. As I said, you can um, donate um, in a couple of ways. You can do it on our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk. Um, we've posted links in for text giving, um, or you can take advantage of a special membership offer, um, which is £3.50 a month um, by direct debit. And if you sign up as a member, 
um, we'll be sending you a free copy of Matthew Burns' Beautiful Churches book. Now, if you've got any questions, um, if you've got any ideas um, for possible topics you'd like us to talk about, again, please do comment away. And again, if this is your first time joining our lecture, do let us know. Now, Francis, I'm going to dive straight in. There's been loads of questions coming in. Um, and it was quite interesting. You started when you talked about Bungie and you talked about some of the um, archaeology that's gone across Suffolk and we found um, animals that have been buried in churchyards. Obviously in Bury St Edmunds in the Abbey they discovered a collection of wolf skulls. Um, and do you think some of that's to do with um, sort of certainly in East Anglia the legends of St Edmund at all? Yes, um, yeah there was a wolf skull that was discovered um, in excavations around the Norman Tower uh, in the late 19th century I think it was. Um, and yes the immediate thought that came to everybody's um, mind was yeah is, is this connected somehow to, to, to the wolf uh, that guarded St Edmund's head. Uh, in the story, uh, the hagiography, the wolf follows the body of St Edmund back to Bury, and it therefore makes you wonder whether there was some kind of connection between wolves and the, the abbey site. And we just don't know the answer, but I think we, we can know that animal remains were used, whether, whether those animals were buried alive, which is a horrible thought, or whether they were buried dead, um, animal remains were used for this apotropaic purpose, which means warding off evil. Um, and perhaps because of the significance of the wolf to Bury St Edmunds, a wolf skull was chosen for that purpose. But we just don't know. And that's the frustrating thing about archaeology. We don't have a lovely accompanying document that explains everything and why people did it. We just don't know. But it's nice to have all this folklore around that and sort of think, you know, and start to draw those theories out and um, what could have been. So um, thank you for your answer there, Francis. Um, another question here is that, what was the first recorded appearance of a ghost um, in the um, gauzy, insubstantial um, kind of format as opposed to a revenant? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of study of ghosts in literature. Um, probably the most famous ghost in all English literature would be the ghost of Hamlet's father. Um, who, of course, appears in, in armour, uh, and there's no suggestion that he is, you know, gauzy and floating above the ground. I, I think essentially the stereotype of the ghost in the sheet comes from the fact that people were buried in shrouds. And when you look at early engravings of ghosts, they tend to be revenants wearing a shroud that's sort of tied at the top, which is the, the classic way that people were buried in a shroud. And I think that it comes from, from that, and it's, it's around about the beginning of the 18th century, that you start to get this portrayal of ghosts drift, drifting around wearing the shroud. And then the, the ghosts seem to become more and more see-through. They become more and more transparent over time. And I don't know, perhaps it's a, a loss of connection with the revenant that gradually the ghost becomes more a kind of shade of the person as they were when they were living rather than this reanimated corpse of the person as they were dead. Um, but yeah, the, the ghosts become, yeah, less and less substantial. But it's, yeah, it, it, there's a number of studies on, on, on the literary aspect of that. And it's mainly in literature, but also in illustrations like engravings and cartoons and things like that, that you can see the development of that ghost. Thanks, Rob. And that's really fascinating. And everyone, um, as I said, we've recorded our lectures and one lecture to check out is the lecture Dr. Christina Welch did on cadaver tombs, because she actually talks about, as what Francis just talked about there, about the burial shroud being tied at the top. Um, there's, she actually showed some amazing engravings um, in terms of brass, um, brass engravings, where you can see that development of how people were buried um, and how they were memorialised um, in death. Um, Francis, on our next question, I'm going to combine two questions here because um, so they're about a similar thing. Um, are you firstly aware of the vampire's grave at Mal Malyu Churchyard on the Isle of Man? And um, also, what were the English equivalent of vampires? Um, yeah, I vaguely heard about a, a vampire's <laughs> graveyard on the Isle of Man. Um, I'm afraid I don't really know very much about the Isle of Man. Um, but yes, they were absolutely equivalent to um, uh, uh, vampires in English folklore, but really only quite early on. I think the, the best known story, the best known folk story about vampires is Croglin Grange, um, which is still current in the 19th century, but I think it's from Northumberland. And that is about a, a corpse that you know, rises up and sucks the blood of the living. And of course, M.R. James also writes a, a ghost story about that in, in Count Magnus. 
Um, but really in England, it, it, it sort of falls out of folklore quite early on in the Middle Ages. So you find a lot of this stuff in the 12th century. Um, clearly it was going on a bit later in the Middle Ages if we take that evidence from Warren Percy as anything to go by. But um, yeah, the, the, it's not really written about later in the Middle Ages, but we do occasionally come across what are known as deviant burials, where somebody has been treated in a strange way, like having a stake driven through mm -hmm. the body. What I would caution though, is that when we find bodies with stakes driven through them, often this is um, actually not so much to do with vampirism, it's to do with a fear of somebody who died a, an untimely and violent death, particularly people who committed suicide. There was a tradition right up until the early part of the 19th century of nailing the person down with a stake. And it wasn't to do with the worry that the person would be a revenant, it was a punishment. It was holding that person down so they couldn't rise on the day of judgment. So it's actually unrelated to vampires. Um, so no, there's no, there aren't really any more recent stories of vampires in English folklore. It's more something that you find in Eastern Europe. Thanks, Francis. Um, and someone's asked here, how did you get interested in folklore? Well, I've always been interested in folklore. I, I, I used to, as a child, collect books of fairy stories. Um, and yeah, I've been fascinated by the connection between places and traditions. Um, you know, I, I was brought up in Suffolk, um, very close to where M.R. James was brought up. And, you know, quite early on, I became aware of those stories and that sort of spooky tradition around the Berry St. Edmunds area. And um, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to find more out about these stories. But as a historian, I suppose my real passion is gaining accurate historical background to folklore. Um, and accurate um, early versions of stories rather than simply accepting, you know, something we might read in, you know, a popularized pamphlet or, you know, a, mo a modern, you know, ghost tour or whoever is promoting folklore. I'm interested in getting back to the sources and doing folklore in a rigorous historical way. Thanks, Rod. Um, we're going um, to Suffolk with a couple of questions. Um, or well, certainly this question comes from Suffolk. Um, this is from Sudbury. Um, at St. Peter's Sudbury, the apotropaic markings are almost exclusively in the South Isle to keep out the devil um, out of the South and keep him in the North. Is that why they might be there? That's interesting. I, I, I've not heard of um, apotropaic marks at St. Peter's Sudbury, but it's worth bearing in mind that the medieval graffiti survey has done a complete survey of churches in Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. Um, I think one of those might still be ongoing, but they are certainly expected to be complete very, very soon. And um, yeah, the, those, um, that project has uh, revealed lots and lots of apotropaic markings. Um, why they would all be concentrated in one place is very unclear, but then we don't really know much about apotropaic markings. I, um, I routinely do translations for the medieval graffiti project. When they have anything in, in Latin, um, it tends to come to me. Um, to look at. And yeah, some of that stuff is, is apotropaic, is warding things off, but a lot of it is also people doodling things um, and, you know, just having a bit of fun or whiling away the hours. So it's, it's, yeah, it's very difficult to know why the graffiti is there. I think it's a bit like the dead animals. We just don't know because we can't go back in time and ask people. And people tended not to write down why they did it. So I'm afraid I can't really sh shed a great deal of light on why the apotropaic marks would be in that place. And sort of linked to that um, is we've had something come in here about um, obviously churches um, often have ch um, several porches, some of them do, and linked into that kind of um, the south side being sort of maybe less holy. Is there a link here to be said about baptism? Because there's sometimes folklore around during um, the liturgy of baptism, the south porch door would be left open for evil spirits to escape during baptism. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's linked really to what I was talking about with the font. Um, the, the location of the font next to the north door is, is, is traditional. And yeah, the porch has uh, traditions particularly associated with it, not so much with baptism, but with the, the churching of women. So, uh, but before the Reformation, there was this belief in sort of ritual impurity of a woman after childbirth. So she had to wait for a while and then come to church and then be blessed in the porch before she was allowed to enter. And this lingers in the post-Reformation church. The Church of England still has a service of churching of women, although it doesn't have 
that significance of, of impurity after childbirth. It's just a thanksgiving for the birth of a child. But it, it's interesting that they felt the need to supply this. And likewise, weddings would often take place in the porch. Uh, you wouldn't actually go into church in order to get married because it was sufficient to stand underneath the porch. And I think it's that sense of the porch as a bridge between the secular and the profane, uh, the sacred and the profane, um, and a really important place for the community as well, because you get those benches often along um, old church porches, and that's where people would sit and have a gossip. And it was a public place. You would come there not just on Sundays, but any time you might just come and sit in the church porch and have a good chin wag. So I, I think it's a really fascinating liminal space, you know, between two worlds, not quite the church, but also more sacred than the world. And that the same is true of the Lich Gate, um, you know, the, uh, the, the wonderful wooden structures, most of them these days Victorian, but uh, medieval in origin, which are the entrance to the churchyard and called the Lich Gate because it's where the Lich, the corpse of the, of the dead would, would stop underneath that as part, in part of the funeral rite. So yeah, these are all kind of interactions. And someone's asked specifically about fonts, um, tying in there what you mentioned about baptism. Um, many fonts are lidded and can be locked. Um, someone said here they've written, uh, they've read that this is due to fear that the water would have been poisoned by witches and such um, macabre its tales. Is this true? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm not sure that I'm aware of any authentic folklore regarding uh, water being stolen or, or, or poisoned by witches. It, it wouldn't normally have been the case uh, that water would have been left in a font um, after the Reformation. Before the Reformation, yes, you would have had water in a font because rather like in Catholic churches today, you have these big bowls of holy water and people come in and cross themselves. But after the Reformation, water would only have been placed in the font for the occasion of a baptism. And therefore, the locking of the font has more to do, I would say, with the protection of a holy vessel in the same way that you lock up your, you know, your chalice and, and, and your, your, your altar silver. Um, I'd say it's more to do with that than it is to do with a fear of profanation, simply because water wasn't generally kept in fonts after the Reformation. Thanks, Francis. And um, we're, we're jumping over the border here into um, Norfolk to another one of our churches. Someone's asked a question here about St. Nicholas King's Lynn, and they're asking, um, are you aware or do you know much about the exorcist house in the churchyard in King's Lynn and its significance? It's a really interesting one. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've tried to find out where the origin of that name came from, and I've drawn a blank. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind that exorcist was a minor order of clergy. So if you were um, an aspiring priest, you would have to go through a number of different minor orders before you got to the point of being a priest. And one of those pretty low down the rung is exorcist. And therefore, it, it may well be that it actually has nothing to do with exorcism as such or the casting out of demons. It's more to do with it was a house where a minor cleric would live. So you had... Um, you know, for example, people in the order of doorkeeper or lector or acolyte or subdeacon, and one of those orders was also exorcist. So my suspicion is that it probably isn't to do with someone whose job was specifically to exorcise. My suspicion is it's probably to do with a house that was reserved for some kind of minor cleric, but I don't know. It may well be that it is connected to exorcism, but it's a curious name, and I'd like to know when it was first came into use, but I'm afraid I can't enlighten you on that. Thanks, Francis. Um, and if anyone wants to see it, if you see the new David Copperfield film, um, not only does it show lots of Bracen Edmonds in that film, it also does show the Exorcist House and King's Lynn in it briefly. So um, do give that a watch. Um, we've had a question here. Um, are there any specific post-reformist superstitions relating to wrecked or ruined churches and communities like Castle Acre? Does the destruction work its way into narratives? There's a lot of folklore connected to ruined monasteries in particular. Um, I think that the dissolution of the monasteries is quite a major trauma for the English landscape, but also for the English psyche, in that you get lots of stories of um, you know, spectral monks and curses uh, on land that was once owned by monasteries. Um, not so much uh, ruined parish churches, the kind that you find scattered throughout Norfolk. I'm not aware of anything that springs to mind of, um, yeah, of beliefs associated with, with, with ruined churches. Although I think that, you know, any kind of ruined 
monumental building is going to attract certain feelings of awe and terror. And yeah, some of these places are rather um, unnerving to be in. Um, and I'm sure that people would have avoided them because people uh, tended to avoid abandoned sites. I mean, it goes back to the Anglo-Saxons who tended to avoid abandoned Roman sites, which is why Anglo-Saxon settlements are not usually right on top of Roman ones. Um, and that's something which does continue in English tradition. But uh, the, off the top of my head, I can't think of any examples linked to ruined parish churches, but there's a lot connected to the ruins of the monasteries. Thanks, Francis. And we've had a question that someone's asked about your presentation. You showed a um, rood screen um, from a Norfolk um, church, I believe. Um, they're just asking where what, it was the screen of the devil in the boot. Where, what church was that? Um, I think it was Corston. Um, that's, uh, but don't quote me on that. I might be wrong, but I think I'm fairly sure it's definitely Norfolk and I'm fairly sure it's Corston. Thanks, Francis. Um, how important do you think the Protestant um, disputation of purgatory was in affecting the relationship between the quick and the dead? I think that it was it was very important in that it raised the issue of ghosts and, and put ghosts at the centre of one particular Reformation controversy um, because the reformers were keen to do away with belief in ghosts because they, they, they saw it as a, a bulwark of the, the doctrine of purgatory. And the doctrine of purgatory, of course, was rejected in the Reformation. It's one of the earliest things to go in the English Reformation. Henry VIII says that purgatory does not exist and therefore masses are not effective to get your loved ones out of purgatory. And this is long before you know, the liturgy has gone into English and long before the images have been taken down or, or even the shrines of the saints. Um, so, yeah, this, this war on purgatory is, is huge. But at the same time, I would say that it kind of wasn't significant because it's totally unsuccessful in England. It simply doesn't work. We're still obsessed with ghosts all these centuries later. It's a defining feature of English culture. We love ghosts um, and it just didn't disappear. And this puzzled a lot of Protestant reformers. They couldn't work out why people wouldn't stop believing in ghosts. And eventually they gave in. And, and by the end of the 17th century, you've got people like Joseph Glanville um, the the anti-sagicists, as they call themselves, who are Anglican clergy, who basically say, well, yeah, go ghosts are great because ghosts are proof of the spiritual world at a time when people are starting to question uh, some of the assumptions of religious belief. They see ghosts as actually a, a, a support for religious belief. And so gradually you see the church change its tune and actually become much more positive towards belief in ghosts. But it's, yeah, it's a fascinating question. I'm just going to dive back into looking at grins and dogs um, here because we had a couple of questions coming more about um, the, the role of black dogs. Um, where does the belief that dogs are able to sense ghosts and spiritual apparitions come from um, when humans may not be able to? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the earliest example would be of a description of an animal being able to sense a ghost. Um, I would say that it's it's linked to a, a similar belief that you find certainly in, in the Middle Ages. It's 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 often said that children have the ability to see spirits, and it's to do with innocence. Um, and so, in medieval grimoires, in books of magic, it often instructs you to to let a child look into the crystal in order to see a, a an angel or a demon or whatever. Um, and I think that. Yeah, because animals also have this innocence. There, there's this cultural link between, um, yeah, uh, le lesser beings, animals or children or, or, or whatever, have, have a, 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 a closer connection than, you know, educated adults with the spiritual world. But I couldn't tell you when that first arrives. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly prevalent by the 19th century. You find it often. And obviously you, you, you worked for a bit in Ely. Um, someone's asked a question. Um, you've spoken a lot about the black shuck, but what do you know of the, I, think, I hope I'm saying this right, um, the suck monkey of the Cambridgeshire Fens? Right, I've not heard of that one, I'm no? afraid. <laughs> uh, uh, we've that question. If you've got any links, do please comment away and um, we'll have a look at that. Um, we've had some more stuff coming here. So I've got time for maybe two more questions, everyone. Um, 
would you um, say that there is a link between the correlation of dates such as the Eve of St. Mark's Eve and St. George's Day, which in Dracula is referred to as the night where all evil things in the world will have full sway? Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, the reference to St. George's Night in Dracula is to do with um, Eastern European traditions around St. George's Night. And St. George's Night is, is of immense significance in Eastern European pagan traditions. Uh, this is something I also write about is Eastern European paganism. Um, and yeah, there, there, there is possibly a link there. I think because it is um, in a pivotal time in the transition from spring to summer, it's, you know, from a calendrical point of view, the 20, 23rd, 24th of April um, is, a, is, is a key date. So, yes, it's interesting that it's, it's Mark's Eve in England, where St. George, of course, is also very significant. But for some reason, it's not associated with St. George, but it's associated with St. Mark. But I couldn't tell you why that is the case in England, whereas in other countries, it tends to be St. George's Day. Thanks, Ross. I think this is a really nice question to talk about because you've mentioned um, in your books that you've recommended, you mentioned his wife. Um, so do you know if M.R. James drew any of his stories from folklore? Uh, yes, I think he did. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've been particularly looked at is whether he was influenced by his cousin, by Margaret Helen James, who, who wrote the book Bogey Tales of East Anglia. Um, and there are, there are a few um, uh, possible links, but nothing that's very clear cut. But yes, there are there are definitely folkloric elements in M.R. James's stories. For example, in the ash tree, um, there's a witch. Uh, it's essentially a witchcraft story. Um, pro probably the most folkloric of all James's stories is a warning to the curious. That's the one about the man who tries to dig up the three crowns of East Anglia. Um, and that's um, well, it's simultaneously folklore, but it's also to some extent fake law because he's inventing this um, folk tale about the three crowns of East Anglia that there's no real evidence that that ever was a real folk tale but it sounds like the sort of thing that ought to have been a real folk, folk tale and it's based on the her heraldry of East Anglia which is the three gold crowns on the on the blue background um, but yes it's, it's very much I influenced by folklore around buried treasure around burial mounds around Sutton Who, for example um, so yes there, there is a, a folkloric influence on James. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Francis, for answering those questions. And um, thank you so much again for your um, presentation to us. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it. If this is again, if this is your first time, um, do let us know um, if you enjoyed it. Um, we hope to see you all next week. Um, next week, we are joined by Susie Lennox, who is going to be talking to us about body snatchers and what churches did to try and prevent them um, from stealing corpses from their churchyards so join us next thursday at 1 p.m for that lecture but once again everyone thank you for joining us and um, remember that we record all these lectures um, so if you've missed any of our previous lectures do look on our facebook video playlist and you can watch them all there but if you've got any questions um, or any comments do um, comment away or do um, send us a um, direct message but again thank you so much francis for joining us and thanks everyone for joining us on another thursday lunchtime lecture thank you very much